Section three of All of Grace by Charles Spurgeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. It is God that justifieth. Romans eight thirty three. A wonderful thing it is, this being justified, or made just. If we had never broken the laws of God, we should not have needed it, for we should have been just in ourselves. He who has all his life done the things which he ought to have done, and has never done anything which he ought not to have done, is justified by the law. But you, dear reader, are not of that sort, I am quite sure. You have too much honesty to pretend to be without sin, and therefore you need to be justified. Now, if you justify yourself, you will simply be a self-deceiver. Therefore do not attempt it. It is never worth while. If you ask your fellow mortals to justify you, what can they do? You can make some of them speak well of you for small favors, and others will backbite you for less. Their judgment is not worth much. Our text says, It is God that justifieth, and this is a deal more to the point. It is an astonishing fact, and one that we ought to consider with care. Come and see. In the first place, nobody else but God would ever have thought of justifying those who are guilty. They have lived in open rebellion, they have done evil with both hands, they have gone from bad to worse, they have turned back to sin even after they have smarted for it, and have therefore for a while been forced to leave it. They have broken the law and trampled on the gospel. They have refused proclamations of mercy and have persisted in ungodliness. How can they be forgiven and justified? Their fellow men, despairing of them, say, they are hopeless cases. Even Christians look upon them with sorrow rather than with hope. But not so their God. He, in the splendor of his electing grace, having chosen some of them before the foundations of the world, will not rest till he has justified them and made them to be accepted in the Beloved. Is it not written, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Thus, you see, there are some whom the Lord resolves to justify. Why should not you and I be of the number? None but God would ever have thought of justifying me. I am a wonder to myself. I doubt not that grace is equally seen in others. Look at Saul of Tarsus who foamed at the mouth against God's servants. Like a hungry wolf, he worried the lambs and sheep right and left, and yet God struck him down on the road to Damascus, and changed his heart, and so fully justified him that ere long this man became the greatest preacher of justification by faith that ever lived. He must often have marveled that he was justified by faith in Christ Jesus, for he was once a determined stickler for salvation by the works of the law. None but God would have ever thought of justifying such a man as Saul the persecutor. But the Lord God is glorious in grace. But, even if anybody had thought of justifying the ungodly, none but God could have done it. It is quite impossible for any person to forgive offenses which have not been committed against himself. A person has greatly injured you, you can forgive him, and I hope you will, but no third person can forgive him apart from you. If the wrong is done to you, the pardon must come from you. If we have sinned against God, it is in God's power to forgive, for the sin is against himself. That is why David says, in the 51st Psalm, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight. For then God, against whom the offense is committed, can put the offense away. That much we owe to God. Our great Creator can remit, if it so pleases Him. And if He remits, it is remitted. None but the great God, against whom we have committed the sin, can blot out that sin. Let us, therefore, see that we go to Him and seek mercy at His hands. Do not let us be led aside by those who would have us confess to them. They have no warrant in the word of God for their pretensions. But even if they were ordained to pronounce absolution in God's name, 
it must still be better to go ourselves to the great Lord through Jesus Christ, the Mediator, and seek and find pardon at His hand, since we are sure that this is the right way. Proxy religion involves too great a risk. You had better see to your soul's matters yourself, and leave them in no man's hands. Only God can justify the ungodly, but He can do it to perfection. He casts our sins behind his back. He blots them out. He says that though they be sought for, they shall not be found. With no other reason for it but his own infinite goodness, he has prepared a glorious way by which he can make scarlet sins as white as snow, and remove our transgressions from us as far as the east is from the west. He says, I will not remember your sins. He goes the length of making an end of sin. One of old called out in amazement, Who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger for ever, because he delighteth in mercy. Micah 7.18 We are not now speaking of justice, nor of God's dealing with men according to their deserts. If you profess to deal with the righteous Lord on law terms, everlasting wrath threatens you, for that is what you deserve. Blessed be his name, he has not dealt with us after our sins, but now he treats with us on terms of free grace and infinite compassion, and he says, I will receive you graciously and love you freely. Believe it, for it is certainly true that the great God is able to treat the guilty with abundant mercy. Yea, he is able to treat the ungodly as if they had been always godly. Read carefully the parable of the prodigal son, and see how the forgiving father received the returning wanderer with as much love as if he had never gone away and had never defiled himself with harlots. So far did he carry this that the elder brother began to grumble at it, but the father never withdrew his love. Oh, my brother, however guilty you may be, if you will only come back to your God and Father, He will treat you as if you had never done wrong. He will regard you as just, and deal with you accordingly. What do you say to this? Do you not see, for I want to bring this out clearly, what a splendid thing it is, that as none but God would think of justifying the ungodly, and none but God could do it, yet the Lord can do it? See how the Apostle puts the challenge. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. If God has justified a man, it is well done, it is rightly done, it is justly done, it is everlastingly done. I read a statement in a magazine which is full of venom against the gospel and those who preach it, that we hold some kind of theory by which we imagine that sin can be removed from men. We hold no theory, we publish a fact. The grandest fact under heaven is this, that Christ by his precious blood does actually put away sin, and that God, for Christ's sake, dealing with men on terms of divine mercy, forgives the guilty and justifies them, not according to anything that he sees in them, or foresees will be in them, but according to the riches of his mercy which lie in his own heart. This we have preached, do preach, and will preach as long as we live, it is God that justifieth, that justifieth the ungodly. He is not ashamed of doing it, nor are we of preaching it. The justification which comes from God himself must be beyond question. If the judge acquits me, who can condemn me? If the highest court in the universe has pronounced me just, who shall lay anything to my charge? Justification from God is sufficient answer to an awakened conscience. The Holy Spirit by its means breathes peace over our entire nature, and we are no longer afraid. With this justification we can answer all the roarings and railings of Satan and ungodly men. With this we shall be able to die. With this we shall boldly rise again and face the last great assize. Bold shall I stand in that great day, for who ought to my charge shall lay? while by my Lord absolved I am from sin's tremendous curse and blame. Friend, 
The Lord can blot out all your sins. I make no shot in the dark when I say this. All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. Though you are steeped up to your throat in crime, he can with a word remove the defilement and say, I will, be thou clean. The Lord is a great forgiver. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Do you? He can, even at this hour, pronounce the sentence, Thy sins be forgiven thee, go in peace. And if he does this, no power in heaven, or earth, or under the earth, can put you under suspicion, much less under wrath. Do not doubt the power of almighty love. You could not forgive your fellow man had he offended you as you have offended God. But you must not measure God's corn with your bushel. His thoughts and ways are as much above yours as the heavens are high above the earth. Well, say you, it would be a great miracle if the Lord were to pardon me. Just so. It would be a supreme miracle, and therefore he is likely to do it, for he does great things and unsearchable, which we looked not for. I was myself stricken down with a horrible sense of guilt, which made my life a misery to me. But when I heard the command, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. I looked, and in a moment the Lord justified me. Christ Jesus, made sin for me, was what I saw, and that sight gave me rest. When those who were bitten by the fiery serpents in the wilderness looked to the serpent of brass, they were healed at once. And so was I when I looked to the crucified Saviour. The Holy Spirit, who enabled me to believe, gave me peace through believing. I felt as sure that I was forgiven, as before I felt sure of condemnation. I had been certain of my condemnation because the word of God declared it, and my conscience bore witness to it. But when the Lord justified me, I was made equally certain by the same witnesses. The word of the Lord in the scripture saith, He that believeth on him is not condemned. And my conscience bears witness that I believed, and that God in pardoning me is just. Thus I have the witness of the Holy Spirit in my own conscience, and these two agree in one. Oh, how I wish that my reader would receive the testimony of God upon this matter, and then full soon he would also have the witness in himself. I venture to say that a sinner justified by God stands on even surer footing than a righteous man justified by his works, if such there be. We could never be sure that we had done enough works. Conscience would always be uneasy, lest, after all, we should come short, and we could only have the trembling verdict of a fallible judgment to rely upon. But when God himself justifies, and the Holy Spirit bears witness thereto by giving us peace with God, why then we feel that the matter is sure and settled, and we enter into rest. No tongue can tell the depth of that calm which comes over the soul which has received the peace of God which passeth all understanding. JUST AND THE JUSTIFIER We have seen the ungodly justified, and have considered the great truth, that only God can justify any man. We now come a step further, and make the inquiry, How can a just God justify guilty men? Here we are met with a full answer in the words of Paul, in Romans 3, 21-26. We will read six verses from the chapter so as to get the run of the passage. But now the righteousness of God without the law is being manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God which is by faith in Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Here suffer me to give you a bit of personal experience. When I was under the hand of the Holy Spirit, under conviction of sin, 
I had a clear and sharp sense of the justice of God. Sin, whatever it might be to other people, became to me an intolerable burden. It was not so much that I feared hell, but I feared sin. I knew myself to be so horribly guilty that I remember feeling that if God did not punish me for sin, he ought to do so. I felt that the judge of all the earth ought to condemn such sin as mine. I sat on the judgment seat, and I condemned myself to perish. For I confessed that had I been God, I could have done no other than send such a guilty creature as I was down to the lowest hell. All the while, I had upon my mind a deep concern for the honor of God's name, and the integrity of his moral government. I felt that it would not satisfy my conscience if I could be forgiven unjustly. The sin I had committed must be punished. But then there was the question of how God could be just, and yet justify me who had been so guilty. I asked in my heart, how can he be just, and yet the justifier? I was worried and wearied with this question. Neither could I see any answer to it. Certainly, I could never have invented the answer which would have satisfied my conscience. The doctrine of the atonement is to my mind one of the surest proofs of the divine inspiration of Holy Scripture. Who would, or could have thought, of the just ruler dying for the unjust rebel? This is no teaching of human mythology, or dream of poetical imagination. This method of expiation is only known among men because it is a fact. Fiction could not have devised it. God himself ordained it. It is not a matter which could have been imagined. I had heard the plan of salvation by the sacrifice of Jesus from my youth up, but I did not know any more about it in my innermost soul than if I had been born and bred a Hottentot. The light was there, but I was blind. It was of necessity that the Lord himself should make the matter plain to me. It came to me as a new revelation, as fresh as if I had never read in Scripture that Jesus was declared to be the propitiation for sins that God might be just. I believe it will have to come as a revelation to every newborn child of God whenever he sees it. I mean that glorious doctrine of the substitution of the Lord Jesus. I came to understand that salvation was possible through vicarious sacrifice, and that provision had been made in the first constitution and arrangement of things for such a substitution. I was made to see that he who is the Son of God, co-equal and co-eternal with the Father, had of old been made the covenant head of a chosen people, that he might in that capacity suffer for them and save them inasmuch as our fall was not at the first a personal one, for we fell in our federal representative, the first Adam, it became possible for us to be recovered by a second representative, even him who has undertaken to be the covenant head of his people, so as to be their second Adam. I saw that ere I actually sinned I had fallen by my first father's sin, and I rejoiced that therefore it became possible in point of law for me to rise by a second head and representative. The fall by Adam left a loophole of escape. Another Adam could undo the ruin made by the first. When I was anxious about the possibility of a just God pardoning me, I understood and saw by faith that he who is the Son of God became man, and in his own blessed person bore my sin upon his own body on the tree. I saw the chastisement of my peace was laid on him, and that with his stripes I was healed. Dear friend, have you ever seen that? Have you ever understood how God can be just to the full, not remitting penalty nor blunting the edge of the sword, and yet can be infinitely merciful, and can justify the ungodly who turn to him? It was because the Son of God, supremely glorious in his matchless person, undertook to vindicate the law by bearing the sentence due to me, and therefore God is able to pass by my sin. The law of God was more vindicated by the death of Christ than it would have been had all transgressors been sent to hell. For the Son of God to suffer for sin was a more glorious establishment of the government of God than for the whole race to suffer. Jesus has borne the death penalty on our behalf. Behold the wonder! There he hangs upon the cross. This is the greatest sight you will ever see, Son of God and Son of Man, 
There he hangs, bearing pains unutterable, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. Oh, the glory of that sight! The innocent punished, the holy one condemned, the ever-blessed made a curse, the infinite glorious put to a shameful death. The more I look at the sufferings of the Son of God, the more sure I am that they must meet my case. Why did he suffer, if not to turn aside the penalty from us? If, then, he turned it aside by his death, it is turned aside, and those who believe in him need not fear it. It must be so, that since expiation is made, God is able to forgive without shaking the basis of his throne, or in the least degree blotting the statute book. Conscience gets a full answer to her tremendous question. The wrath of God against iniquity, whatever that may be, must be beyond all conception terrible. Well did Moses say, Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Yet, when we hear the Lord of glory cry, Why hast thou forsaken me? and see him yielding up the ghost, we feel that the justice of God has received abundant vindication by obedience so perfect and death so terrible, rendered by so divine a person. If God himself bows before his own law, what more can be done? There is more in the atonement by way of merit than there is in all human sin by way of demerit. The great gulf of Jesus' loving self-sacrifice can swallow up the mountains of our sins, all of them. For the sake of the infinite good of this one representative man, the Lord may well look with favor upon other men, however unworthy they may be in and of themselves. It was a miracle of miracles that the Lord Jesus Christ should stand in our stead and bear that we might never bear his Father's righteous ire. But he has done so, it is finished. God will spare the sinner because he did not spare his son. God can pass by your transgressions because he laid those transgressions upon his only begotten son nearly two thousand years ago. If you believe in Jesus, that is the point, then your sins were carried away by him who was the scapegoat for his people. What is it to believe in him? It is not merely to say, He is God and the Saviour but to trust him wholly and entirely, and take him for all your salvation from this time forth and for ever, your Lord, your Master, your all. If you will have Jesus, he has you already. If you believe on him, I tell you, you cannot go to hell, for that were to make the sacrifice of Christ of none effect. It cannot be that a sacrifice should be accepted, and yet the soul should die for whom that sacrifice has been received. If the believing soul could be condemned, then why a sacrifice? If Jesus died in my stead, why should I die also? Every believer can claim that sacrifice was actually made for him. By faith he has laid his hands on it and made it his own, and therefore he may rest assured that he can never perish. The Lord would not receive this offering on our behalf and then condemn us to die. The Lord cannot read our pardon written in the blood of his own Son, and then smite us. That were impossible. Oh, that you may have grace given to you at once to look away to Jesus, and to begin at the beginning, even at Jesus, who is the fountainhead of mercy to guilty man. He justifieth the ungodly. It is God that justifieth. Therefore, and for that reason only, it can be done, and he does it through the atoning sacrifice of his divine Son. Therefore, it can be justly done, so justly done that none will ever question it, so thoroughly done that in the last tremendous day, when heaven and earth shall pass away, there shall be none that shall deny the validity of the justification. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Now, poor soul, will you come into this lifeboat, just as you are? Here is safety from the wreck. Accept such deliverance. I have nothing with me, says you. You are not asked to bring anything with you. Men who escape for their lives will leave even their clothes behind. Leap for it, just as you are. I will tell you this thing about myself to encourage you. My sole hope for heaven lies in the full atonement made upon Calvary's cross for the ungodly. 
On that I firmly rely. I have not the shadow of a hope anywhere else. You are in the same condition as I am, for we neither of us have anything of our own worth as a ground of trust. Let us join hands and stand together at the foot of the cross, and trust our souls once for all to him who shed his blood for the guilty. We will be saved by one and the same Saviour. If you perish trusting him, I must perish too. What can I do more to prove my own confidence in the gospel which I set before you? End of section 3